Good evening. Thank you for attending our artist talk tonight. I'm Jocelyn Gardner, founder and chair of Print London. And on behalf of our collective, I'd like to welcome everyone to the third in a series of artist talks titled Exploring Intaglio, Making Conceptual Magic. This series of talks has run through the month of June and has so far featured the work of Elizabeth D'Agostino and Emma Nishimura. As with the talk by Timothy Lauren tonight, which will conclude the series on Intaglio, these virtual talks are recorded and live streamed on Facebook. If you have perhaps missed any of them, they will be available on the Print London YouTube site for repeat viewings. For this series, we've invited Ontario-based artists to speak about how they incorporate intaglio into their wider practices. All of these artists have been manipulating this traditional medium in fresh and inspiring ways as a means of expressing contemporary ideas and issues. Whether fragmented plates, working with layering through sheen collet and collage, mixing media, or incorporating intaglio into sculpture and installation formats, they're all pushing the boundaries of one of the oldest printmaking techniques. I'll now turn over to Cindy Talbot, who will do our land acknowledgement and advise on how to have the best viewing experience on Zoom tonight. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Jocelyn. Good evening and welcome. I'm Cindy Talbot, Vice Chair of Print London. We are hosting tonight's event from London, Ontario. We acknowledge that the land on which Print London gathers is the traditional territory out of, of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Lene Pewak peoples who have long standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames, First Nation. Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. We, we value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island, North America. So I'm also gonna give a few technical housekeeping notes for those of you who are joining us on Zoom. For optimal viewing on a laptop, you're going to select the speaker view. To do that, you click view in the upper right corner of your Zoom window and then click speaker view. That way you're just going to see the speaker and not all of the boxes with the names in them as well. To avoid distractions, we've muted your mic and turned off your video. And we ask you to stay in that position for the remainder of the presentation. We, we will be fielding questions during the presentation for Tim to answer. Uh, I think that we've agreed that we're gonna do them at the very end. So what we will ask you to do, if you would like to ask a question, type it into the chat box and our moderator, Jocelyn, will read the questions to Tim. So if you're joining from a laptop, you should see a toolbar along the bottom of your screen. You click the three dots and more, then click chat. You will select the option to send the chat to everyone. That way everyone's going to see the message that you want to ask and will avoid duplication. If you're on a cellular device, tap your screen to bring up the toolbar, click the chat icon, and then select the option to send to everybody. If you are viewing through Facebook Live, you can type your question into the discussion box below the live stream. I will be monitoring that and I'll pass the questions along to Jocelyn in the Zoom chat. Uh, so I think that takes care of everything, Jocelyn. I'll go back to you. Thank you, Cindy. So now I'd like to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Timothy Lauren. Timothy Lauren is an established artist based in Peterborough, Ontario, who has worked in several artistic mediums over his career. Originally primarily interested in making sculptural objects in clay, glass, and metal, his focus over the past 20 years has shifted to traditional and non-traditional print media including intaglio, letterpress, woodcut, mokuhanga, and artist books. Working between abstraction and representation, he often approaches his image making through a sensitive, almost ritualistic exploration of the materiality of the medium he's engaging with, allowing the process of manipulating the copper or wood to influence the outcome. Color is often used symbolically and his subject matter is rooted in his family heritage, history, and memory as it relates to contemporary society. 
Tim was educated in the early 80s at Sheridan College School of Design and later gained his MFA in printmaking from York University in Toronto. He has taught in several art schools in Ontario and most recently retired from teaching at Georgian College where he led the printmaking department. He has exhibited throughout North America and internationally and his work can be found in several collections most notably the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Art Gallery of Burlington, Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives, and the Corning Museum of Glass in New York. We're excited to welcome Tim to present his work to us tonight. And I'll ask him now to turn on his camera, mic, and um, upload his PowerPoint. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Um, uh... Let me just switch over to the PowerPoint now um, and uh, we'll get started. Um, firstly, I have to you know, thank uh, Jocelyn and Cindy and, and the collective uh, Print London for creating these uh, series of talks. I think they're an incredible resource and I'm glad that they're uh, recorded and people can watch them at a later date. Um, I want to just briefly explain my approach to tonight's talk. If you were lucky enough to watch the last couple of talks, um, you'll see mine is somewhat different uh, in that they were so beautifully focused on one series and explained it uh, beautifully. I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit more, uh, hopefully explaining to you how um, I got to uh, printmaking and specifically intaglio and what some of my sources and inspirations are. Um, so as uh, was mentioned, I did start my education, my interest um, as a maker. Uh, I apprenticed with a pottery studio, production studio as a teenager and then went to Sheridan School of Craft and Design. Uh, as it was located in a separate uh, campus back in the 80s. And at this school, uh, they had five major studios, um, clay, glass, fiber, metal, and wood. I went there to uh, study clay and I thought I would become a studio potter. But uh, on the, taking uh, some of the other studios, I became very interested in glass. Um, and sort of focused my education at that point uh, in glass studio. And, and really the focus of the school, which was really founded on the principles of the Bauhaus, um, really uh, dedicated to fine craftsmanship, um, pure design aesthetics, and an understanding of materiality. And this really leads into some of the elements uh, that I brought with me to printmaking. So for about 15 years, I ran a hot glass studio in my hometown, which was a small town on Georgian Bay. Um, and really my focus at this point was looking at how pattern uh, integrates with form and how color is also part of the design element here. While I was um, working in my glass studio for half of that time, I shared it with uh, the Canadian painter and printmaker, um, John Hartman, known as a landscape uh, artist. And um, while we were uh, sharing studios over many coffees, we would discuss various elements of, of the art world. Um, and he really encouraged me to uh, start thinking more two-dimensionally and get involved with, you know, painting and printmaking as a, another outlet. So I basically, at that point, started auditing courses at Georgian College, uh, which was about 45 minutes from where I was. Um, and um, uh, John was teaching there, and also Stu Oxley was running the print studio at that time. Uh, so Stu became a very uh, powerful influence in my understanding of printmaking and my development of uh, visual language, if you will. And um, so as uh, Stu was exiting his time at George and I ended up uh, stepping in and taking over the print studio um, and uh, basically uh, worked there uh, part time as an instructor in print media uh, for about seven years. Um, here you can see one of the uh, large format steamroller projects that we did while I was there. Um, so that was a lot of fun and uh, obviously not intaglio, but yet another element. 
So this is probably one of my very first uh, attachment or first attempts, if you will, at uh, Intaglio when I was auditing some of the courses. And um, as we know, Intaglio is very much um, about line. Um, so naturally, uh, I was basically interested in simply transposing some of the line drawings that I would have in the sketchbook. Um, and being in a very rural area on the shores of Georgian Bay, the uh, elements of the landscape played very much into, um, you know, my visual language as well as my daily activities. So this was a simple um, single uh, color, single plate uh, dry point in Talia with the Shinkale, uh, basically looking at uh, an acorn from the end point of view. Um, and this was the first time I used Shinkale, and I absolutely fell in love with the process. Um, and essentially, I've used Shinkale in virtually every print since then uh, when working in the studio. So uh, I really just enjoyed the uh, way that the line was translated uh, into the print itself, whether that's the beautiful soft line of a dry point or the more... Um, uh, crisp line that you see here in an etching. Um, and uh, I really uh, started to investigate and uh, fall in love with all the Japanese washis uh, that are available, obviously, through Japanese Paper Place, um, and um, started to um, investigate, as I said, all the different ways that uh, the uh, various washis can affect the outcome of the work. Now, uh, being a Canadian and uh, working uh, uh, in, the, in the nature and with Georgian Bay and the landscape in a small town, I started to struggle with the baggage of the Group of Seven and how powerful the landscape has become and part of our you know, visual um, vernacular. And um, I wanted to start to remove myself from that. So again, these are all just simple sketches that I would make either directly on the plate or in a book and then translate them to a plate later. Um, uh, and, you know, from a camping experience in this case. But in this print, the plate itself started to degrade. And I'm not sure if that was because I didn't apply the ground properly or the plate had a lot of um, abrasions before I started because I tend to take a very raw approach to the material. And um, I get I got more excited about the stippling of the plate and the the accidental scratches than the intentional lines that I was creating, and that comes back in a little bit. So then I wanted to move away from the landscapes uh, specifically and started to um, create images of objects um, that I work in. And as mentioned, I do work in sculpture, specifically glass and concrete um, cast objects. So these were sort of drawings of various cast objects that I was uh, contemplating making. Um, and sometimes they did come to fruition in the casting, um, but the drawings themselves had a certain energy that I wanted to capture in the plate. And at this point, I was really intrigued by this notion of um, when does an object uh, stop becoming a tool and start becoming a weapon? And I was really intrigued by this balance between those two elements. You know, uh, a, a hunting knife is an important tool for survival, but, you know, depending on the motivation, it can become a harmful weapon. So these were all objects that I saw in my mind uh, around this issue. It's also important to note these are incredibly tiny um, uh, prints. Um, they're about two to three inches in scale and scale comes into my work very much as I'll talk about in a moment. So from there, in my studio, um, music is a, a very important part of uh, the creative process for me and in my studio. And I was surrounded by all these CDs. So yes, that was that time before streaming. Um, and one day I was looking at the CD thinking, my God, this is a beautiful plate. And um, I immediately took some and started, you know, the unthinkable, which is scratching violently into the CD, which, as we know, would ruin its intended purpose. But I really, really enjoyed 
uh, both how smooth and beautiful the scratching process was in this plastic and the fact that I was moving away from the rectangle and uh, being a potter and a glassmaker, uh, round is in fact the, the uh, shape that I tend to think and design in. So the CD became a really important um, a symbol for that. Uh, again, the size of it is important because they're tiny. Um, and uh, as you can see, the one on the right, um, I started to shinkole dressmaking patterns onto my work at this point. My mother uh, was a seamstress, so I grew up with this uh, tissue paper um, that had these marks on them, which were again utilitarian. So I wanted to integrate this kind of mark making that was commercial uh, in a random way onto these CDs. So this uh, produced my first artist book um, after making, you know, probably 30, 40 of these CD prints. I decided to put them together in a small portfolio. And uh, as you can see here, calling them corrupted files because obviously the CDs were uh, not useful for their intended purpose after I was finished working with them. That of course led to uh, other circular uh, plates. And um, in this case, I turned to my old music collection, which were 45s and LPs, and hopefully some of you listening will remember those. Um, and one of the things that really intrigued me about this is they were already engraved. They're already a beautifully created intaglio plate. Um, so what I wanted to do was play around with this idea of layering the various um, uh, records uh, and what happens when we start, you know, mixing the musics as a DJ would. Um, and so I started thinking about the actual titles of the uh, music that I was incorporating um, and how the two would actually sound together um, and then putting that together in a visual representation uh, simply by inking the uh, record. Um, it would then translate all of that information because as we know, uh, the record's information and music is embedded in the grooves um, on the flat vinyl. I then started reverse intaglio in that I started removing some of the uh, grooves, um, either by sanding away or by dissolving the vinyl with acetone, which was then removing that information. One day when out driving along, I found these large saw blades sitting at the side of the road. Um, and these blades are um, about 28 inches in diameter. So quite a shift for me because I tended to work uh, the size of my hand. And uh, so these were very different for me. And I was immediately struck by uh, how time had uh, basically already etched the plate for me. Um, they had really beautifully um, luscious, rich surfaces um, that didn't require much from me other than inking them up and printing them. So these ended up being printed on 32 by 32 inch square uh, BFK paper, and probably one of the few prints that did not have uh, a Shenkole washi applied to it. I did end up eventually adding um, back into the center of these um, uh, CDs, uh, once again, filling that center spot, and they would then have various layers of the, uh, the washi paper as well. So this was a really interesting experience for me because I had just acquired um, the largest Praga press, which has a 32 inch wide bed. And that opened up a lot of possibilities for me at that time. It really caused me also to consider the role of scale um, and how that affects the final work as well. At this time, I was um, reading uh, and in, uh, investigating the work of John Cage. Um, uh, I mentioned that I was uh, teaching part-time at the college, and one of the courses that I developed and was teaching at this time 
was uh, art history, but specifically modernism. And I was really struck by the writings of John Cage, specifically his appreciation for materiality, which goes back to my earlier education, but also the role of chance. Um, and if you know anything about John Cage's work, chance is one of the major contributors to his work. And here's a beautiful print that uh, was done by uh, John Cage in uh, 86, so at the end of his uh, career, uh, whereby he was burning paper and laying that down. So allowing the process, allowing the material to do the designing. And this really spoke to me. And uh, as his quote says, you know, chance uh, elements can make much better art than I can. So why not take that into the studio with you? So this was one of the first works uh, sort of deviating from that other path. And um, I had a huge uh, garden full of poppies at this point. So I grabbed one of the petals because uh, I couldn't seem to completely let go of representation at this point and use that as a strong graphic element as a, a soft ground into a zinc plate. Um, it's important to note that this series is the exact size of my hand. And um, as I mentioned, scale, I think scale is probably one of the uh, less appreciated elements of design uh, because it can really uh, change how uh, the viewer interacts with your work and what kind of statement you can make. So this whole body of work was based around my hand, which I believe to be one of the most um, uh, the proportions that we tend to relate to the best. Uh, we like to have items that we can easily hold in our hand, but we also like to have things that are the proportion of it. Sorry. So anyway, with this series, I'm taking a bunch of uh, zinc plates, all of the same size, and making random um, uh, marks on it through hard ground, through soft ground, etching them, and then randomly layering the different uh, plates together. Um, and in this case, integrating two uh, pieces of uh, washi as a shinkole, um, creating sort of this duality of the visual plane. Um, not knowing exactly why I was creating this duality at this point, but it does start to make sense later on. And then completely abandoning any sense of representation and truly just exploring uh, the mark making, how things move through the ground, um, what kind of marks are left behind, uh, what do the different times of etch uh, communicate when we start uh, developing that plate, and again, develop, uh, uh, breaking the visual plane into two elements. Um, uh, so this is, I think, three or four plates layered together uh, with the two shinkole uh, pieces. I love the shinkole process, especially on small scale, because of the challenge uh, of layering and aligning the uh, uh, beautifully delicate papers um, onto the plate. And especially when you're dealing with two separate ones like this, trying to get that seam to line up is, um, is uh, both frustrating and rewarding. So now, um, around the same time, um, I started to uh, work at a museum. Uh, so here's the thing, as an artist, we all have side gigs, and one of my side gigs beyond uh, teaching part-time is working in museums and galleries. Um, so at this time, I was doing a contract with the police museum, the OPP Museum in Aurelia, and um, um, I was uh, looking at or uh, researching their collection of mugshots. I had always been intrigued by the concept of a mugshot. And um, one of the things that interests me, especially with early mugshots, is that for most of these people, it was the only time in their life that they were photographed. Um, and we tend to think of photographs as a way of recording, you know, important moments in our lives, celebratory moments. But yet with a mugshot, these are uh, photographs taken of somebody in crisis. Um, so I was really uh, interested in these mugshots. So I started 
researching various mugshots throughout history. And I came across this one, which caught my eye because this was uh, from the Southern US, but this was a young man that was arrested for stealing a rabbit, um, most likely simply to feed his family, but yet ended up being incarcerated because of it. So at this point, I'm taking a, a photocopy, a laser print of the image and doing a, a acetone transfer onto the Japanese papers and then layering that onto random plates. This is again, a very small print. It's four by four inches because as we know, there's always lots of great calls for print exchanges. And this one had to be four by four inch. And I love composing within the square. Um, so in this case, again, we've got the uh, mugshot uh, partially in one section and you can start to see even, um, this is a more contemporary image. Uh, you can see the um, uh, graphics on the wall behind him uh, measuring his height. Um, and then I was, uh, because this person uh, was arrested for assault, I basically aggressively attacked various printing plates. So this is two plates with um, a pre-stained chincolé uh, on top. Uh, this one's referred to as the Bertillon series, and I did a whole series of these of people that were measured. And part of the Bertillon uh, phenomena, if you will, was he was a researcher that believed that if he measured enough criminals' facial features, that we would eventually get to understand some commonalities and therefore be able to predict someone's um, uh, tendency towards criminal behavior. So with these mug shots, uh, they would measure the length of the nose, the size of the ear, the width of the mouth. And his hope was eventually we would get enough information. That never really happened because later on we discovered um, fingerprints and his whole theory of our um, you know, tendency to criminal behavior uh, was driven through our body parts, uh, really fell apart. But in any case, it produced a really interesting series of photographic mugshots. And this is two um, photographs, um, a safe blower, um, a, an old photo, uh, mugshot in the lower portion of this uh, piece with uh, an early um, uh, explosion uh, of uh, early testing of atomic bombs in the upper portion. Um, and then the plate itself is a bunch of random marks through sugarless process. Um, I really enjoy the uh, material of the sugar syrup and how it reacts with the plate when you start splattering and playing around with it on the surface. Um, and again, I was uh, pre-staining the Japanese papers that would then be layered and uh, have these images transferred onto them. They would, of course, all get unified when they are uh, put through the press and shinkalade onto a cotton paper. Several stripes of different papers overlapped in this case and somewhat of an intentional mark making of these circles uh, in conjunction with the random markings on the plate itself. Again, this is a fairly small piece, probably about six, seven inches wide. So around um, uh, 2008, uh, through a, a strange circumstance, it was discovered that um, I come from um, uh, a Métis background. Um, and at this point, our family was completely unaware that we had any Indigenous heritage. And um, so upon doing some research, I discovered that um, several generations back, a grandfather actually had two wives simultaneously, one a European wife and one an Indigenous wife. And my family is a product of the Indigenous uh, wife. And um, my family comes from Drummond Island, uh, which is a small island uh, to the north part of Georgian Bay. And during the time of Confederation, one of the um, uh, one of the 
bargaining chips, if you will, the British gave up this island to the US in part of the negotiations for territory. And as a result, the British took virtually all of the inhabitants from Drummond Island and settled them in the Penetanguishene area because that was the site of a naval base uh, prior to this. Um, so most people uh, in that region come from Drummond Island. And um, what was uh, done at this point is the family, when settling, uh, hid this, this knowledge, this uh, understanding of having any Indigenous heritage. Um, for obvious reasons, it was not an advantage. It was a huge disadvantage to be Indigenous at this time. So they simply uh, erased it and was never talked about. So when I discovered this, it opened up uh, an interesting can of worms in terms of what was, um, you know, what was our background? What did it, it mean? As a young child, I would play cowboy and Indians and um, the cowboy was the good guy and the Indian wasn't. And then all of a sudden I discover I'm both. So that led me to look at my family history. And at the same time, I was offered uh, a two-person exhibition at the McLaren Arts Centre in Barrie. Um, and uh, so I decided to use this research that I was doing along with some family photographs um, and make a series of pr uh, prints based on it. Um, and they were all 24 by 24, roughly, the plates, um, because that's a really great dimension when you cut up a four by eight sheet of aluminum, but also it relates to your torso, which again is important uh, proportion for me. Uh, so this is the first photograph of me. This is little Timmy sitting in a blow up swimming pool. Uh, and ironically, I'm sitting probably 10 feet away from the shore of Georgian Bay. And um, unfortunately, it's a very bad photograph. It's, it's quite bleached and overexposed but it produced this really interesting ghost-like image. So I was using this image um, and would do a photo transfer onto our phototype onto the Japanese tissue. Um, and then the metal plate, I would then start splashing uh, etchant and various materials onto it somewhat randomly to sort of mimic the rhythm of the waves of the beach. Um, there's also an embossing there and uh, it's actually, uh, a dressmaker's uh, collection of pins. They would often come in this round circular format of these uh, dressmaking pins with the round ball ends. Um, so that's what's uh, uh, embossed in the bottom corner because again, my mother uh, was involved as a, as a seamstress. This is uh, another one in that series. Um, and this is a photograph of my mother uh, standing on the same beach. Uh, could even be the same day, I'm not certain. Um, and what I did is I, I was really just struck by this uh, incredible pose uh, in this incredible bathing suit um, of my young mother. And um, so what I did is I, I layered this with a uh, 24 by 24 inch plate and she's standing or being superimposed uh, with a sugar lift of my torso, um, which sort of turns into these hills, which are very common of the sand dunes of this area. And um, the bottom brown sort of wave-like uh, pattern, again, referencing both landscape and the water. And around her, I took a, 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 a brass fitting, if you will, from a really tacky lamp and press that into the plate, which left this really beautiful round halo-like kind of um, em embellishment into the plate itself. The little red spots off to the left are in fact bullet casings that I press between the two plates. And for me, it was really about this duality between you know, the aggressive behavior of bullets and this sort of um, idolization of the halo. This is actually the uh, oldest known photograph of my mother. Um, she's a toddler sitting on the grass uh, next to a doll. And um, it, it too had either, the, I only had a negative of, of this, and it was either quite degraded or was never properly exposed. Um, but again, I was drawn to this ghost-like quality. Um, I was really intrigued by how the face of my mother mimicked the face of the doll. Um, but yet a lot of the information wasn't there. So I decided I was going to add that information back. 
And this was an important step um, as I, I, I later become very obsessed with this idea of removing and adding information into the plate itself. So this is the installation shot of the show at, uh, that ended up uh, basically chronicling uh, my family heritage. Um, and it was a two-person show, as I mentioned, and it was a really beautiful pairing with Virginia Mack. Um, and Virginia had just returned to her uh, country of origin and taken a series of photographs of herself in her sort of ancestral places. Um, and what's wonderful with her work is she goes into the dark room and physically shoots these uh, images through Japanese washi. So this is actually filtered. The light information of her photographs is filtered through traditional Japanese paper um, and produces these wonderful sort of hazy memory-like quality images. Um, I was down one side of the gallery and her work was mirrored uh, on the other wall of the gallery. So it was a really interesting conversation between the two bodies of work. Now, um, in 2013, I had a, a life-changing experience in that I bought an iPhone. And um, one of the things with iPhones is its connection to the internet and all the wonderful things that that gets, um, but also all these various apps. And um, so one of the apps was um, a, a, an app for men to share information and share their profiles. And um, I, I ended up creating a lot of friendships through this and people that I knew, people I didn't know. Um, and this was a really new experience for me of interfacing with technology. And this became um, probably my first um, foray into my ongoing battle with analog versus digital. Um, um, but in this case, what I decided to do is I did screen capture of all of their profiles that existed on their um, web page or their app. And I reproduced their um, uh, profile photo, their portrait, to the exact dimension of the screen of my phone. So all of these metal plates are the exact dimension of the photograph that as it would appear on my phone, because this is the way that I knew these people. Uh, they were photographs and this was their scale. Um, so through a series of drawings of a combination of a dry point uh, onto aluminum uh, and combined with a spit bite, I created a whole series of uh, portraits based on it. And this became a second or I can't remember how many of this, but it became an artist book. Um, and so basically it was looking at how we interact uh, in the new digital era. And um, so it became a series of uh, 10 people um, combined uh, in this booklet again. It included myself and my husband. And um, luckily this book had has been exhibited in uh, both the US and Australia which was really uh, uh, unusual and surprising for me. Um, this is a current series that I'm working on, which is an extension of that other series. And as you can tell, this is not intaglio, this is reduction wood block, but, uh, or lino block, uh, but I wanted to say how this uh, kind of interest bounces back every so often. So this is, again, uh, portraits of people that are posted on TikTok, and in this case, they're basically thirst traps in that they post uh, revealing pictures of themselves trying to get the viewer to subscribe to one of their uh, fan pages. Um, I'm in the middle of this and it may turn into a book or it may not. So I'm bouncing around with the timeline here a little bit, but um, I, it's this is an important uh, genesis of another series um, in 2010, uh, I purchased uh, an old one-room schoolhouse uh, south of Barrie, north of Bradford, in what was uh, a village called Tyrone. It doesn't exist as such anymore, but it did at one point have a school, etc. Uh, and I renovated the space into uh, a very large open space, which became my living space 
and my studio. So I was really, really fortunate to have such a beautiful space to work in. The south wall had 23 running feet of large windows. Um, so it had incredible light. And um, this shows you what my studio space was looking like at the time. You can see a saw blade print at the back, some of the other works, and my very large Praga press. So one of the things with the schoolhouse is uh, the reason I could afford it was it was in really rough shape and needed a lot of renovation. So for the first year, I actually wasn't living there, but instead was traveling back and forth from my residence to the schoolhouse almost daily to do the renovations. Um, and I enjoyed the drive because it allowed me to travel through some of the beautiful countryside farmlands of this region. And um, I started to realize how much of an impact that horrible Canadian legacy of landscape was having on me again. Um, so what I started doing on my daily drives, um, and you have to realize this was when we were still allowed to text while driving, I would stick my iPhone out the window and randomly shoot maybe 50, 100 uh, pictures as I drove up to the schoolhouse every day. I ended up amassing thousands of these photographs, and then I, I whittled them down simply from, um, you know, purely gut kind of response to these photographs, and then started taking these photographs, transferring them onto um, the Chincolet paper, and marrying them with some random plates that I had as well. Uh, these are the size of my head, which is another very important uh, proportion for me. Sometimes the plates involved um, sugar lifts, sometimes scratching. I tried to think about what kind of mood I was in when I was traveling through the landscape that day and matching them up with appropriate kind of graphics of these chance mark making on the plates themselves. This is the largest one in that series. Again, it's a 24 by 24 torso size. Um, you know, very violent kind of storm rolling in one day. Um, and I was thinking about Viking lore. So, you know, antlers popped in once or twice. Now, later on in around uh, 20, uh, I think it was around 2013, um, I had a, an aunt um, who was childless, an aunt and an uncle. Um, who was preparing for the end of her, uh, her life, and she was basically getting rid of everything that she had amassed over the years. Uh, this is an important aunt and uncle because my parents met at their wedding. So if it wasn't for this aunt and uncle, I wouldn't be here. So one day when visiting her, she said, oh, do you want, you know, all my, my pictures, my slides? And um, I said, sure, just because I thought it would be easier than saying no. Um, and I also remembered as a young child, you know, one of the uh, happy memories was going to visit them and we would have slideshows and they would show us pictures of all these very exotic places that they traveled to. And, um, you know, I realized later on that almost everywhere they went was within an hour of our hometown. But to me as a youngster, these were pretty exciting images. So I took them home thinking I would just get rid of them at some point and I started looking at them and they started really speaking to me um, on many levels. Um, I, and I, there was over 3000 images uh, starting from just negatives to black and white photographs to transparency slides to um, Polaroids. Um, so I started going through them and uh, going down, you know, memory lane and realizing that this is family, but I didn't know or recognize 99% of these images. So this really started me thinking about what do I know? So these are some examples of some of the images that I would pull out. I would just simply go through them very quickly. And again, out of almost uh, immediate response or even by chance, I would select the odd one. Um, so you can see on the right uh, uh, negative and on the left, probably the most composed photograph out of all of them, uh, this beautiful sort of water landscape. My uncle was not a great photographer, which created some really intriguing moments in photographs. And I tended to gravitate towards those uh, sort of odd captions of activity. One of the things with um, slides is the emulsion itself is just sitting on this plastic film. 
And with a little bit of uh, help with something like bleach, that emulsion lifts off. Um, so I started peeling off segments of the slides and combining them. Um, so sort of, you know, layering the memories and the images together, uh, sometimes by chance, sometimes by intuition, and creating new slides. And from these slides, I would then create these phototype transfers and then uh, also layer them onto several plates. Sometimes I would draw back on top of them afterwards if I felt they needed something or if I needed something to add. Um, so I created a whole series from these slides and these images. Um, uh, oh, look, another landscape. Um, here, canoes layered with lily pads with, I think, a sky. Um, and the other thing, too, is you can start to erase some of that image and some of that emulsion. Uh, going back in, coloring them, layering them with sugar lifts, etc. Now, at this time, um, there was a real push at the college where I was uh, in the print studio to, um, you know, uh, integrate digital technologies. Um, so I it, it, uh, introduced photopolymer technique into the print studio. Um, and, um, you know, I followed the traditional way of working with it with, um, you know, the filter and uh, creating the half tone and all of that. But I also really liked when the plates didn't go right, um, especially uh, when they um, overexposed or when I purposely started to overwash them, overdevelop them. So what I started to do was, you know, uh, extend the exposure time of these plastic plates. Uh, let them soak longer than um, recommended, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of aggressively brush them to uh, remove parts. And then I ended up with this kind of image that referenced photography, but also started to um, become purely graphic. And I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I also at the same time started transferring photographs from my uh, aunt's collection, uh, doing photo transfers directly onto metal plates, um, and then etching that metal plate with the uh, acetone transfer, leaving a resist. Uh, in this case, it's several plates, two plates in this case. Uh, and again, this is quite tiny. It's about three by three. Um, and, you know, the, the interaction of the same image, but exposed differently, uh, creates this interesting interaction between the two layers of color. Here's a, another example, again, a small plate where, you know, part of that image is photo representational. And part of it starts to take on a very, um, you know, purely graphic abstract sense. Um, I'm uh, cropping and playing with the photographs a little bit at this point, um, really trying to focus in on what was drawing my attention. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this conflict between cowboy and Indian has always been part of my um, uh, thought processes. So here's uh, the young child playing cowboy. Um, and again, this is a photopolymer plate, but parts of it get uh, removed so that the yellow chincole shows right through. There's no ink. Uh, there's also a pink viscosity roll on top. And uh, this led into a whole series and exhibition called Duo, where I created all the works uh, from my Métis point of view, whereby it was a two-person show and I was both people. Um, I was Cowpoke Tim, and I was also Timmy Two Flames, um, and created works uh, under those two different personas. Unfortunately, there were no Italio in that, so we won't talk about that tonight. Now, in um, 2015, I was really fortunate uh, in that I was accepted into the Graduate Studies Program at York. Um, I'd always wanted to go back to school, but never had the opportunity uh, until this time. And uh, my proposal was to really investigate these 3000 images and integrate them into my print practice further. Uh, so one of the readings I started to do in preparation for this, uh, somebody suggested to me Susan Sontag's book on photography, 
And it had an incredible impact in my research and how I approach the photographic image. And, you know, this quote here, all photographs are memento mori. To take a photograph is to participate in another person or thing's mortality, their vulnerability, mutability, precisely by slicing out this moment and freezing it, all photographs testify to time's relentless melt. Um, and this coming, this collection of photographs, uh, as I said, was coming from my aunt at the end of her life, dealt with this idea of mortality and vulnerability. And I was really struck by how photographs freeze time. And I wanted to investigate that further. So after the first semester, during Christmas break, I took out a whole bunch of these um, uh, black and white prints, these small, some of them are contact prints, some of them are a little larger from this collection. And as I said, I didn't know anything about them, but I felt as though they were, you know, trying to tell me some secret, uh, but they simply weren't giving up this secret. So I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to go into that photograph and release some of this information. So I took some sandpaper, some 1000 grit, um, you know, emery cloth paper, and started sanding into the photograph. Again, something you're not supposed to do, but I felt compelled at this point. So this was my setup over my Christmas holiday in front of those large windows, and I just started sanding away. Sometimes I would purposely start to sand areas. Other times I simply sanded the photograph until an element started to reveal itself. Um, sometimes removing the person, sometimes removing the landscape, but creating a new narrative within that. I also realized that what I was doing physically was I was um, sanding away the silver oxide that produces the image. So I felt that I needed to add that back. So what I started to do was um, layer back in some of these open areas, a silver leaf. Again, changing the narrative, changing what was going on, but being struck by you know, both the beauty of silver uh, as well as how it has interacted with light. So what I really felt I was doing is I was releasing light that had been trapped for 50 years plus. Um, and by doing so, I was reactivating that moment in time. So in some ways, I was a time traveler by this process. Um, and in this photograph, um, here the person is very tiny, which is unusual for photographs of this time, as we tended to put the person front and center in the camera. And this photograph had lots of creases and bends in it, um, which started to make me think that it this person was being abducted and being pulled up like an alien. Um, and that led to the sort of cloud spaceship in the sky pulling him up from his barn. And what I realized is my quest for trying to understand the stories behind these um, led to stories happening in my head as I was going through this ritualistic activity of sanding the photograph. And so I started creating these little stories, these little vignettes built out of, you know, things I heard as a kid, either family lore, but mostly just pure imagination. This turned into um, probably my uh, most ambitious artist book. Um, these are beautiful uh, little Kozu card stocks. Um, that come full deco this size, and they're perfect. They're like trading card size. Um, and as an object, they're stunning. And so I used them to start to put together my little scenarios. One of my advisors was the uh, well-known filmmaker, John Grayson. And we spent a lot of time talking about what is narrative and how is narrative achieved, both visually and with words. So um, I'm also a letterpress fanatic. So I started using my letterpress to craft out some of the little stories that I felt these images were happening. Um, and this is one actual uh, story that uh, is part of my family lore of how uh, I came to be, if you will. So this is how they ended up uh, being presented as part of my thesis exhibition. Uh, Ray Pousse is um, a jeweler's term for uh, creating form out of metal by pressing from behind, which I felt was appropriate. 
Uh, that's a photopolymer intaglio print in, in the front there with some letterpress. So this is a, a unique uh, edition of one um, of 30 images. And the idea here is I created this cast um, uh, desk-like form out of plaster. And um, the idea here is that you could lay these cards out um, and create uh, my background, could create my history, create my childhood. Um, and people could come along and rearrange these cards and therefore rearrange my existence. At the same time, uh, still using these uh, photographed collections, um, York has very large screens for their screen printing, and I'd never had the opportunity to work this size. This is almost human size, um, which uh, uh, was really unusual for me. So I started burning some of these images into the screens, um, and I decided that because I'm so easily seduced with color, I was only going to deal with white ink. And I wanted to bring these historic images into the present moment. So I printed them on synthetic uh, paper, mylar, which is translucent. Um, so this is a photograph of four teenage boys proudly standing for the photographer holding their hunting rifles. And, you know, this goes back to my interest between tool versus weapon. But I was also struck by, you know, their poses and how proud they were holding these guns. Uh, again, I've introduced silver leaf. So what I've done is I've traced out where this image would be and I silver leafed the gun itself and printed the white ink on top. The other thing that I'm doing with this is I'm floating the um, uh, screen print on Mylar over top of the black and transparent acetate that was used to burn the screen, which is giving it a reference back to the negative and uh, allowing a contrast between the white ink and the black background. And in this case, um, I have no idea who this person is again, but I was struck by the vulnerability of this pose of this young man uh, uh, fishing off of this dock with this very uh, windswept typical Georgian Bay landscape in the background. His torso is silver leaf. The other thing I realized is I was really much uh, gravitating towards images that were anonymous. Uh, faces were obscured, parts of the images were obscured. And this ties back into this idea that I should know, but I don't know. Um, the one on the left is somebody uh, uh, about to step into a scoot, uh, which is an early form of a snowmobile that would then go across the ice when the ice is broken up. Uh, basically a hovercraft. Um, it was a death trap. And this is how a lot of people, trappers, uh, would navigate the northern uh, lakes in Georgian Bay region. Uh, the one on the right, of course, is such an iconic Canadian kind of image. Uh, chopping firewood. Um, and in this case, I silver leafed what would be the lake. And I was really struck by how that lake both glistened light the way sunlight does, but also turns it almost into ice as well. This is how they were presented. As you can see, they were loosely floated so that the um, uh, mylar with the white and silver uh, sort of fluttered or floated on top of the black uh, negative that was um, magnetized to the wall. These are large again, almost the same size as a person. And this is how the exhibition ended up. You can see a suite of the sanded photographs uh, traditionally presented in frames with the large format uh, screen prints and then the artist book in the back center. Um, uh, again, uh, I ended up choosing only uh, male images for this exhibition, as this was very much uh, an interesting exploration of my own identity. Now, uh, jumping through time once again, I'm going to end up with this series, my most recent series. Um, and uh, around uh, 2019, um, I, I decided I was going to stop teaching. Um, my partner was also stopping uh, teaching, and we decided to move from the Barrie area to Peterborough. 
So we embarked on uh, getting ready to do all of that. So um, I'm jumping through time and um, that's partly because uh, I do other media and I do other works, but I always find myself coming back to Intaglio. So we moved to Peterborough and when you know it, COVID happens. So we're stuck in a new town, in a new house, uh, and we're not allowed to go anywhere. So we weren't allowed to you know, explore our new city weren't allowed to meet anybody new. Um, and I didn't do well with COVID. Uh, although I'm a hermit, uh, I really didn't do well with being told to stay put. Um, so I decided, uh, I also didn't have a real studio at this time either. Um, and I decided, okay, I've got a little corner uh, in the basement and I wanna make a series of prints and I can't buy anything new. I have to use my existing papers. I have to use whatever resources I have. So I uh, went through the recycling box and discovered that, you know, uh, clamshell berry boxes are incredible printing plates. They go right back to that beautiful seductive quality of the CD. So I started randomly tearing apart these uh, plastic boxes, creating unusual shapes. Um, again, I did not want to deal with the rectangle. And um, with my research with museums, I had worked with another archaeologist before this. Uh, she was, um, she is uh, an expert on um, China uh, clay works, and um, taught, we spent a lot of time talking. I did some collaborative artwork with her, in fact, um, around the idea of patterning on clayware. And since I had started as a potter, this spoke to me as well. So this is my shard series. Um, where I am taking um, previously splattered, stained, sometimes pre-printed uh, washi um, and randomly lining them up with these broken pieces of plastic um, that have a whole range of marks on them, both intentional and unintentional. Um, and the other, this is a part of the rim shard idea in that there's a, a whole uh, study of early pots whereby the patterning along the rim of a pot was believed to actually be a communication device um, talking about what this trading good was uh, and the pot was used for. So I started looking at some of the typical kind of patterning and marrying that with the random mark making. Um, more in this series and this is uh, one that I was very fortunate to have in the recent juried exhibition with Print London, which started all of my engagement here. And as I said, the uh, uh, my interest with patterning and surface um, is coming back. Um, and in this case, you know, I started looking at sort of European regal wear as more of uh, an understanding of this idea of colonial trade and how that informs things. Um, so this is an, uh, an imaginary shard, if you will, in an almost urn-like shape. And here we are just looking at what is considered, you know, beautiful surface design. I've always been intrigued by this uh, need we have as makers to beautify surfaces and how we create these really interesting patterns on the surfaces of whatever we make. And in this case, a print, but referencing pottery. And uh, the last slide, this shows you what the plate looks like. Um, as you can see, they're clear plastic that is broken. Uh, I file the edges, um, I scratch through it, I hit it with things, and then the actual representational image is engraved with traditional uh, engraving tools. So that's the end of my exploration for now. Um, where I'm going from here, I'm not 100% certain, but well, I'm sure Intaglio will play a part. So I will stop sharing my screen at this point, and I do encourage you to ask questions because I consider these talks to be more of a conversation than just me talking to you. All right. So, Jocelyn, are uh, you back? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Tim. My goodness. Uh, as you mentioned, we got introduced to you through the top submission. I had no idea those plates were made of plastic or <laughs> berry clamshells. I can't, you know, 
I'm, I'm still agape. Uh, so beautiful. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Yeah, so much for the talk. I mean, you've given us a wide range from <laughs> your involvement with music and John Cage to the, your sensibility and how it's developed over time is just so intriguing. And um, yeah, I've really enjoyed um, listening. Does anyone have any questions? I, I have a great deal of respect for people who spend their whole career focused um, and refining one element or one interest. Um, but unfortunately, that's not me. And there's a, I'm easily distracted. And there's so many things that I still want to do um, that anytime, you know, I see a squirrel, I run. <laughs> so we've got something from Cindy. Hi, Tim. I've got a comment on the Facebook Live from Andrew Moore. He says, thank you so much. I love the combination of technical and inspirational thought process. Your prints are a fusion of lived experience and exploration of the medium. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment? I think we've actually gone past our time, Tim. Oh, it's okay. Almost yes, I see 10. that. Uh, it's been wonderful. I'm not sure if anyone has anything um, that they want to add here. Uh, you've given us lots of food for thought. Um, definitely, I've been inspired <laughs> by some of the things I've seen. Uh, here's a, Julie. a great compliment. <laughs> yeah. Julie, uh, would you like to speak? Uh, sorry, I don't have my microphone on, so I don't know if I can hear. No, it was was wonderful, um, Tim. I really appreciate everything. I'm doing a lot of work similar, mm. so um, but mostly in lithography and woodcut. But uh, thank you so much for mm. sharing. Uh, yeah, and uh, that was just a clap I had put up. Photography and woodcut is an interesting conversation because they don't tend to um, speak the same language. Um, so I I found. Um, trying to integrate the two to be really um, a challenge because, you know, woodcut being relief deals with shape, um, where photography deals with tone a lot. So it's really translating um, the shapes that are in a photograph uh, into, you know, whatever surface you're carving out. And sometimes that produces some really beautiful compositions, and other times it doesn't. And that's just the nature. Yeah, I'm quite excited by the way in which you, you know, the found object becomes so integral to your work from early in this with the CDs and the LPs and the 45s, you know, right up to the, you know, the the plastic um, <laughs> clamshells. Yeah, like it, it, yeah, it's a it's a blessing and a curse because I'll be driving somewhere and I'm like, stop the car. And I run out and grab something from the ditch. But, you know, whatever. Well, the round saw blades, the just, you know, so much, even the photographs, of course, are, you know, found source material. So, yeah, very exciting. Thank you. Okay, well, I think um, we may wrap up here. So, uh, I'd like to thank you, Tim, extremely much for presenting your work tonight. Really enjoyed it. Um, as we mentioned earlier, it will be available. Um, on the YouTube site. So uh, these will be uploaded uh, fairly soon. I believe Emma's is up already. Uh, and as mentioned, as mentioned earlier, this is our final talk in our June series called Exploring in Intaglio. We'd like to thank you very much for joining us in this series and to let you know that in September, we'll be launching our call for entries for the Ontario Miniature Print BN. Biennale, which um, 2024, uh, which will be held in the summer of 2024. So if you're a Canadian printmaker, please look out for the call and submit work to this national juried exhibition. Um, and as, as Tim mentioned, he was in the uh, last one that we had and came to our attention that way, which is wonderful. Um, so thank you again for joining us tonight. And uh, Please be in touch, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, 
and uh, we're very grateful for you attending our talk. Thanks very much. Good night.